Welcome to the Good Fight Radio Show, a program dedicated to bringing you vital and uncompromised truths that you won't hear in the mainstream media, discussing contemporary issues in light of the Bible and how these issues relate to family, culture, and the church. The heart of this show is to glorify Jesus Christ and expose the works of darkness as He is commanded in Ephesians 5.11. Now here's your host, Good Fight Ministries' own Chad Davidson. Thank you so much for joining us on this special edition of the Good Fight Radio Show. With me, as always, is the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. How are we doing today? Doing great, brother. Yeah, excited about this one uh, with you guys because we have with us today Dr. Ken Wilson, who is an MD, yes, a medical doctor, and he also holds a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Oxford. He practices medicine as a board-certified orthopedic hand surgeon, and he is the author of The Foundation of Augustinian Calvinism, where he writes in his introduction, although it may appear to be an impressively constructed building, a systematic theology is only as good as its foundation. Protestant Reformed theology in the 16th century was built on Augustine's foundation through Martin Luther and Calvin. This book explores Augustine's conversion from the traditional Christian view of free choice and salvation, battling Stoic and Gnostic determinism, back to his prior Manichaean view of divine, unilateral, determined, <laughs> of, etern- determining of eternal destinies. So with all of that, we want to welcome Dr. Ken Wilson to the show. Thank you, Joe and Chad. Good to be here. Well, I, I know I'm excited about this. I had told Joe this as well, and I told you this before show that I was able to go through all of the chapters in this book, starting an introduction and even going through on your conclusion as well with a number of young men, and they were just enamored. It was it was one of those books that we were like, this is this is fun to really get into this. And I know Joe himself has been talking about this subject a lot, so we were blessed by it. I know Joe has a little bit of a, a more background to that as well. Yeah. Uh, praise the Lord, uh, Dr. Ken. Praise God for your uh, visitation here. And we just are so excited about uh, what you're going to share. You know, I'd actually been praying <laughs> your answer to prayer uh, in regard to these uh, two books. Uh, I'd been praying for years that, you know, uh, I've done a lot of work on the subject of, you know, Calvinism as far as refuting it. As a young Christian, uh, you know, you talk to Calvinists and so forth, and there's a very, and we love, we consider, you know, Calvinists our brethren and so forth, but we consider the idea that God, you know, has predetermined the greater mass of humanity for his own pleasure to hell with by I mean, and, and determined every sin they commit and then blames them for it, it to be incredibly heinous and unworthy of our God, you know? So one thing that perplexed me early on uh, as a new Christian, and this is the question I'll ask you in regard to your research, uh, when I was would combat Calvinism, I'd use scriptures like Matthew chapter 27. We're talking, you know, I was, you know, almost 40 years ago, Matthew 27, or sorry, chapter 23, I believe, verse 37 to 39, where Jesus said to you know, the Jewish leaders, how often I would gather together your, uh, you know, gather you together, your children as a hen would her chicks, but you were unwilling, you know, in my old Schofield Bible back then I had, I would have, would have underlined and you were unwilling underlined. And I, and then I was, I was amazed when I went to the early church fathers as a new Christian and bought the Antinicene fathers thinking, what did they believe? And I saw Irenaeus using the same scriptures <laughs> and the perplexity hit me in regard to because at that time I didn't know the context. I was reading. I was wasn't conversant with the anti uh, Nicene fathers. I was re- reading his against all heresies, and Irenaeus became one of my favorites early on. And I was amazed. I'm like, wait, it sounds like he's talking to Calvinists, but I knew that was a later development. And then I started studying Gnosticism. I've done uh, several works on Gnosticism since, and I was blown away. But what was amazing, I saw there was a lot more akin to Calvinists, you know, truthfully and rightfully being called semi Gnostics in a way. When you go from his Manichaean Gnosticism to Calvin a thousand years later and Calvinism, then many evangelicals today being called semi-Pelagians, yet that term never stuck. And I thought, wow, this history has not gotten out. And I've got a couple of books similar to yours, but not similar at all. Very inferior, not nothing against the, the books I've got on this subject that came prior to you. But when yours came out, and I, I got the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism first, and then I got your uh, <laughs> the one that uh, it came from your, your your dissertation from Oxford, and 
uh, just amazed. I mean, I was like, wow, this is quite amazing. Can you tell us why we're finding, I just thought this would be a great first question, and, and please feel free to elaborate. Could you tell us why we're finding quotations from the early church fathers against the Gnostics and the Stoics and so forth, uh, and, and why we're finding them, and that they're similar refutations that we would use today when we're trying to convince our Calvinistic brethren that God is not as you're portraying him? Uh, sure, Joe. Uh, first of all, let me say that when I was reading through this stuff and all the early church fathers read them all, uh, all of Augustine's works, my wife would uh, be sitting in the living room and she and I go, wow, look at this. You know, and she, I mean, I just did it all the time because it was sort of like you. I mean, it was a revelation to me. I go, no wonder there's a problem here. Look what happened. Here, here's where it happened. Here's the problem. So the the bottom line is that the early Christians all the way up through 400, were battling Stoicism, Gnosticism, and Neoplatonism. And all three of these views are highly deterministic. That means they believe that God ordains every particular event in the universe, good or evil. Nothing could be better than it is because the micromanaging God has it all under control. And the Christians absolutely refuted that view one after another, 100% of them that wrote on it, because it's a non-relational God. The Stoics, Gnostics, and Manichaeans had a non-relational God. And the Christians were saying, wait a minute, our God is a relational God. He doesn't just arbitrarily assign people to heaven or hell. He actually loves everybody, wants everybody to come to him, and he only does that based on foreknowledge of what they're going to do. Uh, and that, I'm not the only one saying that. I mean, you look at anyone who's not a Calvinist, and they will say, yes, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, you know, that's that's really interesting, because I wanted to bring up uh, one of the quotes that I had recently been watching. It was actually for an entire another subject, but I was watching a sit-down, and Dr. Michael Haken was talking specifically about, he was asked, hey, do we see in the early church, do we see the five solas being taught? But what he actually asked, answered back was concerning the the tulip and and specifically particular redemption and his argument was eerily similar of some others I've heard come against your work as well that the early church fathers and he was quoting Legan Duncan here that the early church fathers are helpful where there is a controversy but where there is no controversy they're not so helpful and he makes it seem as though that the doctrines of Augustinian Calvinism Calvinism were so ingrained in the early church that there was really no need to be specific about them. That's ridiculous. And now, have you heard this as a common <laughs> argument? And do you, did you come to the same conclusion? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, Chad. Well, yes, those are those arguments, and those are by people who really have no clue uh, what they're discussing. Um, if you look at scholars, legitimate scholars, they're going to tell you that the early church was fighting determinism, that is divine unilateral predeterminism of individuals' eternal destinies. Uh, that's a neutral term I came up with, so we couldn't say fate or predestination. So the, the entire body of early church fathers is arguing against the Calvinist view, not directly, but indirectly, because they're arguing against the same idea just called by another name. So when they make those kind of claims, they are, <laughs> you know, they're closing their eyes, stopping their ears and saying, we're going to believe what we're going to believe regardless of the facts. Yeah, amen. Uh, there are some Calvinists like Torrance who tries to make the early church fathers somewhat reformed, but uh, he'll also admit that, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the tulip wasn't there. But uh, there's Calvinists like John Jefferson Davis. He's, you know, professor uh, in a journal of uh, evangelical society. Uh, he states that, uh, some of the, that he'll mention, for instance, the common view of eternal security that came out later was not taught for the first 1500 years of church history. So then you have guys like James White and others wanted us to believe that, you know, a lot of the people in the early church had Calvinistic tendencies. Well, you, you probably know that I have a, a little podcast with uh, Soteriology 101 with Dr. Layton Flowers. Yeah, very James good, by the White. way. <laughs> so thank you. You're your your reader or your listeners are welcome to uh to t tune into that that's and, worth uh, watching listen. brothers <laughs> sisters yeah <laughs> i mean he's just clueless i'm afraid and his defenses are horrible 
Um, I think if you just listen to it objectively, you'll find out that, that no, even his own people, I mean, you look at Warfield, you look at the big names in Reformed theology, they admit Augustine's the first one to come up with this. And you have to be, you know, dealing under the table to find early church fathers that believe Tulip. It, it just doesn't happen. They, they are arguing against it, not for it. Amen. You know, and, and one thing that I, I've seen a lot online uh, specifically, and even in that, that same interview I was speaking about earlier uh, with Dr. Haken, and by the way, we are with Dr. Ken Wilson, uh, the author of Augustine, The Foundations of Augustinian Calvinism. And you also see, if you're if you're watching uh, with us on, on Patreon, you'll see the, the other book here uh, from his— Now, am, am I getting this right? Is this the doctoral, when I read Augustinian's conversion from traditional free choice to non-free free will, is that a, a dissertation? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, at Oxford, at Oxford, the the uh, D Phil there is a dissertation. Here, it's a THM that's a dissertation. But at Oxford, they have to be different, you know. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, well, you know, before the show, I was like, "Is this a dic- is this dissertation or is this a thesis? I don't want to get this wrong, you know." So I, yeah. you know, I'll just yeah. wait till it starts and I'll ask you. So right. so perfect. But one of the things that specifically, there's a specific work that they all end up pointing to concerning. Hey, we see. You know the, this doctrine, the tulip, really in the first, you know, in the first four centuries as well, and it's Jonathan Gill's work. And maybe you could speak a little bit uh, about that and some of the quotations, because as I said, who I mentioned, Doctor Michael Hay- Haken earlier said he found those very convincing. That the the quotes that he used from the early church teaching what would we we would call the tulip nowadays or Augustine and Calvinism are really convincing. Did you did you find Jonathan Gill's work convincing on this subject? <laughs> well, I was absolutely convinced he was clueless. That that was how I was convinced that he is taking things out of context. He does not know the early church fathers well and he's reading into it his own theology instead of what's there. Again, no and I mean no scholar believes that the early church fathers taught to them. You have to be a Calvinist to find it there. You have to put on your Calvinist glasses and read it with those lenses to find it because it is not there. Yeah, amen, brother. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you have a, in chapter five of your dissertation, uh, you have a, you know, a whole section on, you know, early, you know, the anti manichaean works. But and I wanted to ask you about that, but I thought before we do, just for the sake of the audience who's not really conversant with what happened in the early church fathers for the first few centuries and how Augustine became a, was a Manichaean Gnostic for, and I always, you know, you know, read the historians nine years and you, you've convinced me that it was 10 years that he was Manichaean Gnostic. Anyway, can you get into drawing a line from Manich, from a, you know, Augustine as a Manichaean Gnostic and then his life and actually hold, upholding the view of the early church fathers for the first you know, some would say the first 10 years, but you brought out things I'd never seen before, which I thought were great. I've seen in, in no book, brothers and sisters, you want to grab Foundations of Augustinian Calvinism by Ken Wilson, because it'll it's just a small read. It'll blow you away if you want to graduate to the, the bigger book. <laughs> it's far more in depth and, and, it's, and it's awesome. But uh, many people are unaware of how you had, basically you could draw a line from Manichaean Gnosticism through Augustine to Calvin. And if you could, but the point I was, and then we can maybe get into some of his anti-Manichaean works, showing that he re- first revolted against Manichaeanism until after his, you know, debates with Pelagius and so forth. And it wasn't to what, I think, like 412. Uh, and you've proven that he actually re- redacted, or I should say, edited some of his earlier works. So can you first set this, establish for the person who's like new to this conversation, how this trajectory took place of this Manichaean, Stoic, Neoplatonist determinism through Augustine and to Calvin? Sure. Um, Joe, the answer is that Augustine was trained in Stoicism uh, at an early age. That was his philosophy. And he remained a Stoic uh, throughout his life as far as that identity of a micromanaging God. He he was, like you say, a Manichaean for 10 years, uh, also highly deterministic. He was a hearer in that group. They had the elect and the, uh, and the damned and then the hearers. Um, and then he was also a Neoplatonist. In fact, that's what helped him come, helped him come to Christianity, uh, was a Neoplatonic view where he learned from Ambrose in Milan, Italy. So as Augustine's progressing through here, he finally becomes a Christian. And when he does, as you say, he started 
fighting against the Manichaean view. That is, no, we are not predetermined for everything. God loves everybody. Uh, he doesn't just arbitrarily uh, awake the dead soul from sleep and infuse grace and faith uh, in order to be saved. That, that we as humans actually have a choice to believe in Christ. So he's arguing all that intensely for, for 15 years, he argues that. And then when he fights the Pelagians, he has to explain infant baptism and his whole philosophy, theology flips in 412 and he goes back to a deterministic view undergirded by that Stoic, Manichaean and Neoplatonic foundation. Uh, it, it is absolutely fascinating. When I, when I saw it, I went, Oh my goodness, this is <laughs> unbelievable. Right, and then you actually have uh, Calvin himself stating in his institutes that if he was to systemize his, you know, basically, he basically characterized a lot of his work as a systemization of Augustine. So what you have is Manichaean elements, you know, taking the, you know, along with Luther to a degree, you know, Luther, because of the influence of Melanchthon and justification and so forth, uh, you know, he had the, the will bound for, the pre-conversion, but it seems that after that, he actually, uh, you know, converted over to, you know, at least some degree of free will, you know. But it, it's interesting. Can you speak to the idea that the Manichaeans would actually, it wasn't as though the Manichaeans were working in the vacuum. They actually twisted Romans 9 before Augustine uh, became a Christian. He was under probably some influence of their, you know, not exegesis, but eisegesis of Romans 9 and other passages. Oh, yeah. Um, that's right, Joe, because what you have here is a situation where the Manichaeans are using Christian scriptures. Um, they use Romans 9 through 11. They use Ephesians 2. They, I mean, I make a list in the, in, the, uh, in the book showing the very scriptures that were used by Manichaeans to prove their determinism are present-day Calvinist verses they use to prove their tulip. Yeah, all right. Uh, verse for verse for Amazing. verse. And why is that? Because they pick them up from Augustine. Because Augustine took those verses that he'd argued against and flipped them and went back to the, the Manichaean interpretations. So it's it's absolutely stunning when you see it and go, wait a minute, here's an actual quote from a Manichaean saying this teaches determinism in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 3, and in 2, 8, and 9, and yet Augustine's arguing against it. And then in 412, he turns around and takes the Manichaean view and argues against Pelagius. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> right, which I think is is vital that our audience understands that you're not seeing that in the early church other than with the Gnostics. And Seberg in his early ch her, uh, church history, which I have, uh, he states that these views of determinism, he goes, we don't see, <laughs> and he's, he's another you know early church historian, he says, we don't see them in the early church except with their opponents, the Gnostics. I was thinking when you mentioned uh, Augustine being, you know, or the Manichaeans believing that there were certain people predestined to damnation and people predestined to salvation. Uh, it's interesting. They also kind of had, they had a kind of a three-tier, I, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but it seems to me that they may have had a three-tier view of humanity because they're also the initiates because Augustine was only initiate. He wasn't like one right. of the elect, right? So it's kind of interesting right. to me that Augustine, and see what you think about this, I've often thought maybe he picked up on the Augustinian or the Manichaean view because his view was that there were the lost, then there were the regenerated who didn't have the gift of perseverance, like who were saved, and then there were those who had the gift of perseverance who would be, you know, were the elect. And he seems to have a three view view of salvi you know, salvation history and humanity similar to the Manichaeans. Um, yes. So that's also an interesting point, Joe, because as he is working through this, his he was a hearer, uh, which is an initiate, you know, somebody who's in training, basically, uh, to be a Manichaean. And when you get to the um, whole idea of the um, people who are born again by water baptism, even infants without faith are born again by being dunked in the water, uh, then they're regenerate. And he had to explain Okay, if they receive the Holy Spirit, which he says they do, at water baptism, they receive the Holy Spirit, even as an infant. Why do some infants go on and lead great stellar lives for mm. God and others fall away from the faith completely? So he had to answer that by saying, well, obviously, God must, has to give a second grace of perseverance. 
And this gift of perseverance is the difference between people who persevere and people who fall away. So Calvinism, with their understanding of perseverance of the saints, had to tweak that quite a bit <laughs> to get to where they are today. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and one of the things I've been I've been wondering about this because you you specifically talk about hey he switched these views, but a lot of people say hey I look at his works and I see it in other parts of his works as well. And what would you say to someone who said hey earlier in his works we see determinism as well? So um, it's a very uh, popular view, and even among scholars, that Augustine was teaching this uh, by 396, 397. And, and a work to the Bishop Simplicianus of Milan, um, and also in De Libri Arbitrio on free will. Uh, the problem is that because they've assumed that that writing was written in 386-87, uh, 396-97 for Ad Simplicianum, that that's when he changed his mind. So by reading, starting at his very first work and going through his very last extant work, it's obvious that Augustine went back and inserted ideas into two books, just very small sections into two books that he'd already written. And this has convinced many scholars that, <laughs> that I'm correct. Nobody's ever seen this before, but I think the proof is overwhelming that he went back and revised those two works himself. Uh, and that's what I argued in my uh, Oxford dissertation. Maybe this would be a good time, Ken, if you could explain that you're one of the few people in the world, I don't know if there's a few, that actually, you know, read Augustine from his very first work chronolog chronologically to his last work, and by doing it in that way, because he has a voluminous amount of writings, uh, you were able to see that there was this change, but it wasn't such an abrupt change because he didn't read or he didn't edit all of his <laughs> works, and then you were able to figure out that hey, actually, it's after 412 that he actually, you know, in 412 or so that he has this, you know, transformation. Yeah, Joe. So um, Alan Fitzgerald is is probably the expert on Augustine. Uh, he's a Roman Catholic, uh, and a very nice man. I uh, met him, um, and he told me that he knows five people who have read through all of Augustine's works. Um, so it's not common. Uh, there's a lot of them, uh, and that includes sermons, letters, and all of his uh, books, his written works. So that's a lot of material uh, to imbibe. And the key, as I pointed out in both the Foundation of Augustinian Calvinism and my dissertation is, if you look at the beginning and you go to the end, it becomes crystal clear what happened. The problem is so few people have done that, they get confused and they just piecemeal it. And when you piecemeal it, there's no way you're going to find what happened. Yeah, interesting. You know, I'm reading a, a quote from a couple of quotes from Augustine I'm looking at and and, uh, you know, when we think of Romans 8, Romans 9, and how the Calvinistic interpretation of, uh, of them as, you know, hard determinism and so forth. But in Romans 8, 28 through 30, uh, Augustine says not all, and he sounds a lot here like, you know, he's very much like the earlier fathers. He sounds here. Uh, and he states that, uh, you know, he says, for this purpose is closely bound up with the foreknowledge and predetermination of God. And he did not predetermine anyone unless he foreknew that such a one would believe and would follow his own call. These are those also that he, that he calls chosen. And there's, I won't, you know, bog down the interview with a bunch of quotes like that, but there's quite a few quotes where Augustine is reflecting the view of the early church fathers after he escapes Gnosticism and, you know, before he returns to Manichaeanism. And I just think it's amazing that it's almost as though Calvinists will treat the early church fathers when they come to the understanding that, wow, these guys did be, because they're Calvinists that realize, yeah, the early church fathers did believe, you know, that God foreknows who will respond to his grace and who will not and predestine on the basis of his foreknowledge. But then they'll condemn them as heretics. But at the same time, they won't condemn an early Augustine when he held the same views. <laughs> exactly right, Joe. There's, there's some inconsistency there. <clears throat> I think we can agree on that. So, and you're right, there are many, many writings like that where Augustine holds precisely, not just sort of, precisely the early Christian traditional view, which is God elects based upon foreknowledge of future uh, acts and faith of people. Uh, it's everywhere. 
And so if they condemn the others, they have to condemn Augustine. But it's very interesting. They don't quote those. You, you don't find Calvinists quoting the early Augustine. They always quote him 412 and later. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, you know, just just, you know, piggybacking off that question as well, just I'm wondering if you could kind of kind of give us a, a, just a just a small version of what the early church pre-Augustine would have taught concerning God's foreknowledge. Sure. Um, there was a debate all the way back with Cicero, who was pre-Christ, um, about whether foreknowledge is causative. Uh, because if foreknowledge is causative, and in fact, that's still a philosophical debate today. Mm. Um, I think it's very clear that, it can, that for Christian foreknowledge, divine foreknowledge of the Christian God, that it is not causative. Um, the way I explain that to my classes, or I'm holding a large book, and I say, if I drop this book on the floor, uh, if I drop it, let go of the book, is it going to hit the floor? Now, gravity is not going to change. Nobody's going to interfere. Everything given equal. Is this going to hit the floor? And they say, yes. I said, do you know 100%? Is your foreknowledge 100% this is going to hit the floor? And they go, yes. And I drop the book and it hits the floor. And I said, you just caused the book to hit the floor with your foreknowledge. <laughs> and, and they look at me like, you're crazy. And I'm going, you're right. And so are you <laughs> if you believe that foreknowledge is causative. <laughs> Uh, I, I no, I think that's great. And, and yes, we right now we are with Dr. Ken Wilson. We are discussing his wonderful, wonderful book. Something that has impacted, I know, uh, even in our own church, for a number of young men uh, and women here at the church who were able to get a copy of it and read the foundations of Augustinian Calvinism, and specifically that deals with the foundational understanding of where Augustine got his foundation for his beliefs. So maybe, I know we've talked a lot about the Gnostic Manichaean aspect. I'd love to talk a little bit more about just the philosophical, maybe just to, to bridge this out a little bit more, bring it out, ferret it out uh, for some of our listeners of some of the Neoplatonism as well as um, some of the other Stoicism. philosophical, the Stoicism and so forth, and some of the other camps that he was involved with early on. Sure, Chad. So the Neoplatonic view um, was put out by Plotinus, and uh, Porphyry was his big student, and it became a very popular philosophy. Basically, God is the one, um, that's the understanding, and that he's all spirit, and when you become physical, it's a, more of a dualist idea, when you become physical, you're separated from the one, and the whole go goal is for the people to lose themselves and be reabsorbed back into the one. Uh, little Eastern thought going on there already <laughs> yeah. uh, in 250 uh, AD. So as you're reabsorbed, and, and people cannot do that because they are so corrupted. When Adam fell, Adam completely lost the likeness to God, the image of God. There's zero remnant left. And so God has to infuse faith and love and grace into people in order to, to allow them to respond and come back to him. Um, very deterministic viewpoint, uh, but they couched their idea that this wasn't fate because fate was limited to astrology. And if it wasn't astrology, God could fate anything he wanted, and we're not going to call it fate. So briefly, that's Neoplatonism. You've been listening to the Good Fight Radio Show brought to you by Good Fight Ministries. If you're blessed by this show and would like to partner with us, please consider visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com slash goodfight. Or you can write to us at P.O. Box 2202, Simi Valley, California, 93062. Or call us toll free at 1-866-JC-TRUTH. That's 1-866-528-7884. We hope you'll tune in next time on the Good Fight Radio Show.